of like preparing to live stream the meeting. Mm, 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 mm. Set up your meeting. Mm, 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 mm. <clears throat> and ten We're live. Uh, and the first thing everyone sees is Kate singing. <laughs> <laughs> what a great thing to, yeah, cheery thing to join us with. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our latest in the Nexus webinar series, um, or as uh, Kate has referred to it herself, uh, In Bed with Kate. Uh, in bed with Kate tonight is the lucky uh, Simon Hunt. Uh, no, I didn't know this was going to happen, but there we go. <laughs> Mr. Hunt is a, uh, a prominent, another prominent figure from our uh, community alongside Kate. Um, and so they're both going to speak to us uh, tonight about home learning strategies, um, which I'm sure is something that's been um, very topical uh, for everyone. And there'll be plenty of... Uh, interesting things please do comment on the youtube um feed and we will pass those through to kate and simon um as the webinar goes on i will pass over to you now kate and simon thank you okay hi simon uh hi, lovely, kate. lovely to see you again um nice we to see you. we had a really long chat yesterday so i feel like we probably could yeah well, it was supposed to be just a quick uh this is what we'll do tomorrow we ended up having a full-on podcast pre-podcast podcast, pre -podcast, podcast. Thing put, I reckon we put the education system to rights in about 20 minutes. So, Definitely. Um, so I've got a list of accolades next to your name. Thank I've you got know. inspiring teacher 2018. What? So what happened there? Did you get nominated? And, and what well, were they, you know, what was the nomination for? How, how did you inspire? It's a bit of a weird one because like it is 2020 now, but I'm still going to cling on to that 2018 title as long as I can. But it was, it was, um, it was, I was nominated by some teachers at school and an author called Christina Bali, who's a, she's an, um, an author and an illustrator for Marco Mapogo. So somewhere I've worked with her previous and she sent a video into the Manchester Evening News. So you get nominated then and then they contact you and you have to explain the, some of the things you've done over the year. And all I did was share some of the work and some of the stuff I've done with the kids because um, the best thing about that award was that it was, I was able to go with the kids because really without those guys, I would have just been around a guy stood in a room talking to myself, but because of those, because of the work that the kids did. So it's just as much their award as it is mine. In fact, it's probably more their award than mine. And because they put the hard work in, um, we went from the big awards meal and we're all sat on the table. We're just dead excited. The kids love the fact that the waiters came in and there was some famous people there. And then when we won, um, the kids like shrieked. I mean, if you look at my Twitter, you can see when the, the, the point that we won, the kids all cheered and then we all went up um, together to collect the awards. So I got the kids to get it. And that was really nice. That I was able to do that because um, it's all about them, really. Yeah, that is gorgeous, I have to say. And I think that probably is why you won Inspirational Teacher is that, you know, it wasn't about you. It was about the kids. And we really all know that that's what makes a good teacher. Um so not only have you won an Inspiring Teacher Award, you've also been working with the BBC. Yeah. Bite-sized maths revision session. Yeah, that was, I had my own dressing room, which was larger what? than my lounge. And it said like, and when I got an email, every time I got an email about the BBC Bite That Size thing, it was entitled Talent. So I was classed as a talent, which I thought was quite cool. So I said to my wife, I've got just another talent email. But um, <laughs> So they, they contacted me because I did some work uh, a year ago on the 500 words competition that they do. I did a, like a panel thing afterwards and they must have liked what I did because they said, would you do these teacher talks? So they sent six maths lessons through. Um, I went in the morning. It was all social. It was a bit odd because it was very quiet because it was like full on social distance and time. Um, I had to check in and walk through and then went to this big room with a green. It was a white screen or green screen. And I had the script and I had also a director here. Uh, someone else here, someone else here, and I had to stand there all day. It's, do you know what? I've got a newfound respect for people that read auto cues and do filming live because I, I couldn't say the word. This was it. I had to count to 10 because I was counting to, so I got a bit too overexcited. <laughs> I, I had to count to 10 to the kids and I had to count backwards like that one, two, three, because yeah. it was the opposite way around. And could I do that? I couldn't count to 10 the other way around. I was going okay. one, two, and my fingers it's were getting all confused. That's weird. I poked myself in the eye, kind of went all over the shop. So I had to do loads of takes of me trying to count to 10. 
Um, Can I just say, you've now got like 200 teachers that sat in front of YouTube going. Oh, no, try it back because <laughs> you've got to go the other way. Yeah. I can't, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> it's the mirror image, but yeah, so it, but it was oh, a really good experience because I was able to, I mean, it was nice to do that. And I got to look in the match of the day studio as I went as well. So I kind of had a look in. Um, and then um, after, and then this week, a lot of the lessons have gone live. So the kids in my class and school, they've been able to see me teach them. And the, and the fact that I'm on the red button adds me a bit of uh, cool points when I go Udos. back to school. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was just a great experience. And it was real. And you know what? The BBC really looked after me. It was really nice. I had some chocolates in my room as well. I, oh my God. I had... Did you have a rider? Did you tell them that you wanted like 20 kittens? And... No. Well, what I did, because they said you have to do your own makeup. And I said, what do you mean your own makeup? Because like when you get filmed, you get, I had a really shiny mm -hmm. forehead. So I had to have like powder. So every so often I had to go like that without a mirror and powder my forehead. <laughs> And it, I just, I dropped the powder and then they said, oh, you can keep the brush if you want. I was like, right, okay. I took the brush home and my wife was like, oh, that's such a good brush. And she was really excited that I brought this brush home. She didn't ask me about the BBC day that I've just been filming all day. She said, oh, great brush. So yeah, <laughs> a bit of a tangent there. I don't remember even the original question, but- No, it was <laughs> about you doing BBC Bite Size. You were still on it, don't worry. Oh, okay, so, right, yeah, yeah. Um, it was great fun. So, I have to say, cause this like kind of leads on. Um, I am seriously impressed. I, I kind of did a little bit of research and um, oh gosh. you have been throwing out Kahoot quizzes and all sorts. You're, oh, it's interactive as, and you've said to me on a couple of occasions now that you, you've you kind of um, tried desperately to get people to think about using technology and um, mm -hmm. engaging kids online um, in innovative ways and I mean like you've found some frustrations there I think because people are a little bit frightened of stepping out of comfort zones but tell us a little bit about what you've kind of been doing in that respect. Well the interesting thing was with uh, we use Kahoot in the classroom and it's, it's a really good it's a free app and it's a really good way of getting the children engaged in what otherwise can be quite tedious subjects in a way so because it, they see it as a game so you have the questions on the board the, the kids press the correct answer on, the, on their iPad or a device, whatever it is that they use. And it's a point system and you can see the top five people. So you don't see who's at the languishing at the bottom, which is quite nice because it, it doesn't show that. Um, and then if someone down near the bottom does get a couple of questions right, it shares and such a person is doing really well. Um, so I've always used this and I've always said to teachers, why don't you try using this? And I speak to other people and they're like, mm, I'm not too, you know, that whole, you know, me and technology sort of mm -hmm. side of it. But then when the lockdown happened, people have, teachers have had to sort of try things that they wouldn't have done before i mean how many teachers before lockdown would have heard of zoom not that many um but now teachers everyone knows what a zoom is and if you had i mean before the lockdown if you had shares in flower toilet roll zoom and netflix you'd be doing really well during this period of time. absolutely <laughs> So uh, I've done uh, a few, I've worked with Kahoot and um, I went over, I met the, so Kahoot originated from Norway and it was bought by Google a year or two ago. So when I was in Norway doing some work with HP, I met the people that originally started Kahoot. Um, and then they put me in touch with people over the San Francisco um, side of it. And they said, can you do a live Kahoot because you're using it in school, you've been championing it in school. Um, and I put some tutorials on my Facebook page before. And especially with the lockdown now, because it's a really nice way of engaging with your kids. You can say, we're just going to have a Kahoot. It doesn't have to be educational. It can just be, let's Kahoot and have a fun quiz. Yeah. We had last Monday was guest the teacher. So I had all our teachers send me a picture of them when they were about seven, eight years old. I had the picture and they had to type in or guess which teacher it was. And they absolutely loved it. But it was because of because of what's happened, we were able to do that. And then Kahoot said, would you do a live one with us uh, as part with Kahoot? So I said, yes. And we had something like 800 and something people on wow. one of the playing all at the same time. That and sounds amazing. It was really good. And then like just seeing the names go ping, 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 like the scrolling up, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm used to like 30 in class, not 800. It's, so it's um, yeah, it, it's really interesting. Cause I mean, I've, I've come from international um, schools and we used Quizlet. I don't know if you've ever heard of yeah, Quizlet. Yeah, very similar. Very similar. And so I was like really into it. And I, you know, I used to do massive Quizlets for like hundreds of kids in, in a studio theater and things like that. And it was a great way of getting responses from kids for questionnaires, but it was also a great way of kind of um, revising the really dry material that you mm. don't want to kind of just bang into them from chalk and talk. 
And uh, when I got back to the UK, most schools had got it blocked <laughs> on their IT systems. And I was like, mm. what? <laughs> So it's great. I think that's one of the benefits of the lockdown is that we're going to find people sort of opening up a bit more to the idea of using some of these apps and these these um, online tools mm. that are actually, you know, forever. Of, we've had the ITT template that said use of ICT in the classroom. Um, and we all sort of put record player, <laughs> interactive whiteboard. <laughs> and um, that's it, yeah. Yeah, but we're actually now, I think, really looking at use of ict um as a learning tool so yeah well done on that and it's exciting as well kids absolutely love it and i think we uh, we sometimes underestimate them because when the first one i did um some we thought well how will they react to having to have an app having zoom up and kids get it in about three or four seconds they're like boom just have it like this and then they're away and then the parents sort of see and then the second time we had parents join in and then since then we've had two staff pub quizzes so i've done some with the staff just to just to like catch up and just to have a pub quiz. Awesome. Got, got very competitive. In fact, Mr. and Mrs. Steer, they won the first trophy. There he goes. It's engraved on there. That says Team Steer. So they're the first winners of the uh, Tottenham Primary pub quiz. Um, I will you wipe it down. Do you do one for the whole of Twitter? Because I'd love that. I definitely, yeah. I mean, I did, yeah, I, I'm doing one next week for the, you know, the celebrated next week. I'm doing a pub quiz on a Friday with them, but it's just, it's just good fun. And I kind of quite, I changed my background. I put a disco ball sometimes behind because uh, the virtual backgrounds are really cool. <laughs> so I, I See, put one of those in. So this is going to prompt me to say something to you now, because um, listening to you, I just went, God, he's an entertainer. You know, like, you're like me. I, when I go into, <laughs> that's brilliant. Sorry, I just had to show up. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's brilliant. <laughs> When I go into a classroom, I it's I mean, it's not a performance, but it is kind of like fun. I am like I'm it's it's how do I put it? It's it's like an experience rather than just a lesson. And I was told once that that teachers shouldn't be entertainers, that that's not their job. And I kind of that felt really uncomfortable with me because I actually think it is our job. I think our job is to make learning engaging and that actually if we can add our own love of that to it and the excitement that we feel that brings something to it how do you feel about it completely I'm like the, the way I can describe it is I'm like a big kid I think the kids in my class see me as a big kid and, and because they see me as a big kid they see me as like one of them except the fact I'm supposed I mean not supposed to I mean sort of uh, I, I'm in charge of them and I, I lead the learning but they see that I get excited about things that they get excited about and I think they just feed off it and if you're not enthusiastic and if you don't try to make learn if something's entertaining you're engaged and if you're engaged and you can slip things in so if you're engaged and you're entertaining them you can whack a bit like, like the Kahoot thing it's really good fun it's a game but you can put a bit of spelling and grammar in there and sneak it in on yes. the crowd and realising <laughs> and that's what you've got to do you've got to I call it camouflage learning so learning when they don't realise that that's yeah. Yeah. do you know I had so many I always remember a parents evening where like the kids were like we don't do any work we don't yeah, do any I, work I, I get that a lot <laughs> and I'm like they do they do do work and I'm like what did you learn about entomophagy and they're like oh it's insects you eat insects and we do that because you know they don't produce as much methane or carbon and I'm like see you do learn it's just that you do it in a way that is really fun and you don't realize you're learning <laughs> that's the best way learning without realizing it is the best way to learn yeah, I agree. It's interesting. I went through a phase of doing gamification and mm. looking at things like lockboxes and escape room challenge type things, because obviously I taught older kids. And for me, one of the biggest things was it made me excited. Like I genuinely looked forward to my lessons because I was like, man, this is going to be so good. And I don't know how they're going to, you know, like I literally walked in with that heart race of anticipation, not knowing what the outcome of the lesson was going to be. And I actually really love that because when you teach the same thing year upon year and you're aiming for the same goals year mm. upon year, actually to have that level of kind of like newness in your teaching is, is good for you. It invigorates you as a teacher. And yeah, um, and kids kids know that as well so kids can spot it in, in a second like i think we even mentioned in our pre meeting yesterday when we had a little chat that if you're super excited and enthusiastic like oh, i can't wait to show you this the kids they feed off that if you're like oh, i've got to get through this lesson the kids can sense the just your body language your tone of voice they can see that when it, i've seen 
I can see when a kid can tell straight away that the teacher's not into what they're trying to teach. So then they just switch off already. So that you've lost some of them, but you've got to be excited and you got, you are in it. Yeah. You're an entertainer. You've got to be excited and get them enthusiastic about something. Sometimes things that are quite hard to get them enthusiastic about, but it still doesn't mean you don't stop trying and finding new ways and finding exactly. things to change it. But I think that what we've got to do in that respect is, is find ways to enthuse ourselves as well, you know, and that, I, that's part of it and someone once said to me you know it's a bit gimmicky and I said yeah but do you know what it works for me and and if it works for me then it works for the kids and I think that's kind of like an important part of it um talking about getting kids to do things that are possibly not things they'd otherwise think about I read that you and your kids managed to get legislation changed yeah I'll tell you what Kate this is a it's a long story I'm going to try to condense it as quick as as quick as i can so um it's about five years, five years ago now so um i saw the film that um uh, not netflix the film film blackfish by Net, uh, on netflix which is still on now it's one amazing documentary if you've not seen it before it basically talks about how um killer whales or orcas are too big to be in these small tanks that's kind of what it talks about so i was on a saturday night i watched that and i thought well, i can use that because i'm doing persuasive arguments the week after so I, thought, so I changed my planning on like a saturday night i rewritten what i was going to do First Monday back, I showed them a picture of me at 16 years old. I had curtains because I was really cool. Um, really <laughs> gangly, a bit like a daddy long legs. And, uh, but outside SeaWorld, because I went to SeaWorld when I was 16. And I showed them a video of the killer whales jumping and doing all these fantastic things with fireworks blowing. And it's quite amazing to watch, to see a video. And I said, right, who would like to go? And they're all like, yeah, we'd love to go. Because who wouldn't? Um, and then the next day, um, oh, so we did some persuasive writing to our head teacher to, to send us to Florida to go to SeaWorld. And then the next day I said to the kids, well, how do you think those killer whales got in the tanks in the first place? And they just couldn't answer it. Um, and then I showed them some clips from um, the documentary, which basically shows killer whales being taken from the parents at a young age. And that's what SeaWorld did. Um, and then we kind of looked at, well, the rest of the week, we looked at balanced arguments for and again, choosing some. And I, I mean, throughout the week I said, this is, I believe this, but you're okay to disagree with me. And they need to know that sometimes people mm -hmm. will disagree with you. And that's fine. So we looked at both sides of the argument. And at the end of the week, they decided that none of them wanted to go. So the week after, we, de we decided to write a, like a, a poem about life as an orca. And it was an amazing poem that all the children created together. And then we put it online. And then within a few days, it had a hundred and something thousand views and <gasps> got translated into French because there was an organization in France that translated into French. Um, and then there was videos of our video being played in Parisian schools showing the work we've done. So I said, right, guys, so I'm not going to swap the subject next week for some other topic. We've got, no. we've got them hooked here. I nearly knocked my coffee over then because I got nearly knocked over. Um, so let's do some more work. So there was a legislation that was trying to be passed through that was uh, a guidance for the, and, and the ban of captive cetaceans in EU tanks. And cetaceans are basically dolphins, belugas, killer whales, anything larger than a dolphin they're basically too intelligent to be in these small tanks because it's i mean if you look into it there's so many reasons why they shouldn't be they're basically yeah. too big there's, i mean i could spend about two hours talking about that itself so we collected something like two thousand signatures the kids collected all this stuff and then it made the newspaper and then we um i sent um a, a message to uh, samberg who's from the film blackfish so her friend got killed in one of the tanks um oh. i sent a, a link to our video and she sent me a message back saying that she's already seen the poem because someone shared it with her she said she's got to speak to nbc cnn but she has a spare half an hour to an hour in between if she if we like to interview her so i checked the diary and i said well of course we can, we can squeeze you in so we um interviewed her a few days later she was in alaska i told the kids that we're going this was going to happen they didn't quite believe me because it's not how Mr. Hunt ended up getting like a, a famous person to speak to us. We did. We spoke to her for a good 45 minutes. And towards the end, she was getting a phone call from NBC to say that oh her next interview. And she said, sorry, I'm still in the middle of one, which was really interesting to see. And then afterwards, I was like, well, gosh, we can't, we can't stop now. And then Born Free got in contact with us and they said they're, they're having a full debate and um, a series of events in Brussels around the same time as this um this uh, the protest is like a protest and stuff going on would we like to go so i checked with my head teacher we couldn't afford it because we're struggling with glue sticks obviously so we couldn't afford to pay for it but i found a loophole so um i found that um eu eu parliament have a certain amount of money 
put aside for visits. Yeah. Yes. And I got the Conservative MEP for the Northwest, which I don't know about your political alliances, but I'm <laughs> quite happy that he pays for it. So yes. Sajid Grimm, cheers for that. He um we got ten thousand pounds out of him to send me, my deputy, my TA and 10 kids over, 10 kids from Bullen over yeah. to uh, Brussels. So we got, we sent over, we went over here, we went to the um, European Parliament. Um, we met Sajid Karim and he spent 10 minutes with us because he was basically just doing it for the photographs that he could put oh, in yeah. this thing. But it was fine because he paid for the trip. So we gave him the 10 minutes, we thought. Um, and then we were there for like three or four days. So after we met him, we had a tour around the huge chamber of EU Parliament, had a look around. It was like massive and it was really I've cool. Been, I was there in October. Yeah. It's really big, isn't it? It's absolutely it's crazy. huge. Yeah. And then, then we went around Belgium. The kids worked out that every shop you go in, they give you a taste of chocolate. So we just kept going in every shop and eating chocolate for free. So we spent half the day doing that. And then the next day, um, we were invited to a screening of uh, Blackfish. Um, so I was like, oh, we'll go. I said to my deputy, we're going to a screening of Blackfish. And um, we got to where we're supposed to go. And we didn't realize it was like a full on red carpet thing with press and I thought we just thought it was a screen and it wasn't it was like a full-on thing so I rang our contact and they came down and they got us and they said look just come down the red carpet so we're there wandering down the red carpet with all this press thinking who are these kids in school jumpers because they had their blue jumpers on and That's these brilliant. random people so we're like hello and the kids are like we're getting papped and like getting pictures Aww, all the way down yes we got through we had caviar and champagne and all sort of stuff and, and then we watched the film and then after the film, they said, right, we're all going to the main chamber of EU Parliament to have a debate around the, the issue. And they had SeaWorld executives and then they had Blackfish and people from Born Free, um, from Antidolphinarium, a few other organisations on the main stage bit. And then we went in and they sat us, or they sat us at the front. We didn't realise we were literally sat at the front with the guys in front of us and the whole thing was full. And then they had a half an hour debate between serial executives on this side and then anti-captivity executives on this side, having a full on argument. And then this opened the questions out to the floor. And Bradley, who was over the other end, put his hand up like this. Oh. And leaned over. So the chair kind of looked down and was like, oh, because he didn't realize there were some kids sat there and said, yes. And he pressed the buzzer and he tapped the microphone like that. And everyone kind of cowered down as he banged the microphone and he gave this statistic and, and it was one of the best ones he could have given because he couldn't answer it. He said, why is it that hundred percent of male killer whales have collapsed dorsal fins? And then he looked at SeaWorld and said, that means the fin on top's fallen down because just in case they didn't understand the language, I thought it was quite nice. He explained it to them, but in the wild, it's something like 0.5% and of those 0.5% it's because they're about to die or the ALR or there's something wrong with them. Explain that. SeaWorld couldn't explain that because it was a really good fact and also they didn't expect that from a 10 year old boy from no. oh my god the anti-captivity people kind of was like well done kid because we don't need to do anything here and then there was a person on the end of the um seaward executives that got shooed off to basically find out who we were because the, his job some press guy to find out who these kids who were. are those kids yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what it was and then they said any more questions so obviously all my kids all 10 of them all put Woo! the hand up all press the buzzer and then I kind of sat back thinking, where's Ofsted inspection right now to have a look at this? Yeah. And so they had a full-on argument with SeaWorld and they absolutely wiped the floor with SeaWorld. We left, had photographs in front of all the flags and then we got back. A few days later, um, SeaWorld sent me a threatening letter and threatened me saying that I could potentially go to court because I'm telling the kids misinformation. I wasn't <gasps> showing their information to the others. I rang Born Free and said, um, where do I stand? Am I in trouble? Like... How does this work? So don't worry. What they looked through it. They said what they do is they send this information for people to basically shut up because they'll they're scared of this big company. Off, don't yeah. worry about it. So what I did was I did the opposite. I printed off what they said and all the statistics, put it all on the wall. And as the kids came in, they looked at what they said. First of all, they was really upset that they, they threatened their teacher. Second, they could counter argue and everything that they saw. So we've written some letters back to SeaWorld threatening them that they'd been really mean to their teacher, effectively <laughs> bullying. So we threatened them. So then we got another letter back and then SeaWorld said, well, Mr. Hunt, you are now banned from SeaWorld and all affiliated oh, parks. Oh, no. Which I was <laughs> devastated about because I was just about to go on SeaWorld because that's the whole thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. then um, a year later, I'm nearly finished, a year later, um, a, a letter arrived at home and it was big EU stamps all over it. And I opened it up and it said... The EU Directive Article 4 section, I can't remember what it is, uh, the exact number, has been now been passed and the EU guidance has been handed out to such and such countries have already agreed to it. And 
my my myself and my class are all named on this European parliamentary law that's now been passed and is still in effect now. And to think that those kids, they'd already left me, but I've seen them around sometimes. Those kids have left Amazing. year six. Imagine in year seven, we're doing some persuasive writing. Yeah, I've changed EU law already in year yeah. seven. So and powerful. Then- and then last, not last year, the year before, um, I got flown over to Seattle, to Samwan Island, to present about all the work that we'd done and some more work that we'd done recently. And I was on the island presenting to the people that whose books I'd read, like who I idolized in this big theatre. We Skyped directly back to my kids' back in class in Tottington. Um, I'm pointing that way because my school is about five minutes <laughs> away. Um, directly back to them. And then the, the day after, I went kayaking and I was kayaking with killer whales because that's why they have this conference at Salmon <laughs> Island because they circulate and uh, follow you around. And this was all stemmed from taking a risk, being enthusiastic, and doing a bit of poetry. Kids. Yeah. And getting kids like excited about something and getting them, you know, enthusiastic and wanting yeah. to do something and make a change and realizing that actually they can make a change. And I reckon some of those kids that are taught there, one of them will, I mean, they'll probably do a better job than Boris now, but um, they'll go into not, politics. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to go political, but um, yeah, that those kids have, must have such, such like, rich experience already in their lives and it's to know that they can make a difference at such a young age and they also inspired me as well because i had i completely changed the way i thought about things and think about things and i I do now think differently because of the work we did together so i've I've gone through that very quickly no it's amazing and i was gonna say if you ever need anyone to write the screenplay i'd happily work on it with you um (laughs) I used to run a human rights group um, when I was out in China and we um, had a whole group of girls. It started as a feminist group, actually. We had a whole group of girls who came to us and it came to me and they were really upset because the dress code penalised them for showing their bra straps. And of course, it was 40 degree heat, really, really hot. um, And sometimes you just can't help if your strap slips down, things like that. And we, we set up a project, basically. And as part of it, we research things like objectification and sexualization of women in the media and historically. And the girls came to me about four weeks later with a picture of a Tom Ford uh, magazine, art, like a, an advert of a naked woman, because they tend to do sort of very um, raunchy ads. And they mm-hmm. were like, this is in a magazine for teenagers. And I was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is. That's that's not really very appropriate. And we did um, we did a campaign, and they put together like we had the unit. We had a UNICEF conference basically, um, which a brilliant lady called Lainey in my last school used to organise. And um, they basically presented to the entire school and governors and other visiting schools from China, so international schools. And eventually, we put a petition together on Change.org. And we got 74,000 signatures um, and a response from the Tom Ford advertising agency. What did they say? What did they say? They actually said that they they realised that it was inappropriate and they were going to remove them. Because we'd literally come, we'd we'd hit it at the same time that Ofcom had as well. Um, And so basically um, that that and the pressure from, from... the petition had basically changed their mind so not quite as impressive as yours but i am no, completely the... and do you know what since since i had i think differently i think you never st- I, we said this yesterday didn't we? when we was having a little chat that my kids asked me what you're going to be when you get older mr because they still see me as a big child yeah. and i don't think you ever stop growing and changing and like we've got we've got a daughter like we bought her we had a daughter three years ago delilah and since i've noticed things because I've got a daughter now that I didn't notice before and I didn't realize things and the whole beautiful thing this and when people say you've got a beautiful dress on I'm like oh don't just little yeah. just little things I've spotted because of, and so I've learned off her and she's three she didn't realize um yeah so I, I I don't think you ever change I don't think you ever stop growing even when I'm 72 I'm still gonna be giddy and excitable when a gadget comes through the door and something changes and yeah. I'm still gonna be um, the same Talking about feminism Mm -hmm. and doing it for the to the girl, doing it for the girls. um, I I want to talk to you about yellow dresses. Uh, I want to to talk to you about the fact that Delilah, uh, your daughter, inspired Mm -hmm. a book. Delilah Rose, the Bogey Princess, and the fact that in that book (laughs) she does not wear a frilly pink dress. 
No, she, she doesn't. She wears a bright yellow dress because it's her favourite colour. So is. tell us how that book came about and, um, and what inspired you. So um, two people, really. Delilah, the bogey princess, and also a friend of mine, Anna Lucas, who's uh, an author. She... Um, she okay. helped me. She believed in me and said, you can write. Because I said, what, basically, just before Christmas, my kids said to me, we're talking about um, what you like to be when you get older, when you grow older. And one of the kids said to me, Miss Tom, what do you want to be when you get older? I thought, oh, I'll have a And I said, I'd love to be an author. One day I'd like to write a book. And she said to me, um, well, Miss Tom, you're always telling us we can be authors and politicians and this and that. And why don't you do it if you're telling us? And I thought, well, kind of got to practice what I preach here. So um, a friend of mine, Anna Lucas, has written a really good book called Sir Undercracker. Um, I said, Anna, I really want to write of this book, but I don't. And she said, just start. Unless you start it, you're never going to be able to do it. So that night, I've written pretty much most of the book about something. That you always write about something, you know. So it was Delilah. And the reason why I chose her, because with having children, and Hugo first, and now Delilah, um, bedtime we read two three stories a night and there was loads of books for Hugo about being dirty and poo and bogies and mud and, and jumping and being a bit gross whereas Delilah there's lots of princess unicorn stuff and she's not a princess person she's a she has scraggy hair she has one sleeve up mismatching clothes she jumps in puddles she picks her nose so I thought well I'll make I'll, I'll write my own and that's what I decided to write it about and um, so she's in the book, she's got these stripy socks, a yellow dress, and it's basically her all and all the different types of bogies she likes. She does, <laughs> she does love bogies. And then um, the part of the one was working with the artist. I said, I don't want her to have a pink dress because she's not a pink girl. And I want to kind of, she, she said, well, what's her favorite color? It's the same as mine, yellow. So that's why she's got a yellow dress in the book. And she... The only problem is now we're in lockdown. I've got some books here. There's some on Amazon and eBay, but some books here. And she thinks because she's the bogey princess and she tells people this freely, um, that all those books are all hers. She thinks they all belong to her. So quite often if someone comes around, she'll offer them a book or there'll be a book in the bed or she has her teddies and they've all got a book each. She puts it in the dog. The dog's came to Alice, puts it in Alan's bed. So because, the, because to her, they're all her books. But I just think that when she's uh, a bit older and then, you know, there might be a period when she's like, oh gosh, I hate the fact my dad written that book. Can you imagine knowing as a child that your dad's written a book about you. I'll always have that. And if it wasn't for the kids in my class trying to challenge me, I would never have written it. And I think that's kind of, that's what I said at the start, the whole the inspirational teacher. It's as much their book, their reward as it is mine. And this book is as well, because during the writing process, I would take some of the things into the kids and say, what cover do you like the best? I had six covers that I was trying to figure out which one to use. The kids in my class decided together which one. I said, what size? And it was a different size. So I had like a cord, like, a, I don't know what they call it, a testing, a testing panel. Yeah, of 30 kids. I mean, yeah. technically, is it child labor? I don't know, but I was just asking them <laughs> questions and uh, they were brilliant and now they they feel like that that book's part of them as well and that's why I've dedicated at the front to Hugo Dilla and my class and all the kids I've taught because of that I think it's wonderful I really do I when I was little funnily enough I said on Twitter the other day when I was really little um, I dictated a story to my dad I think I must have been about four or five and I basically told him this story about a little babushka doll um, called Miss Allian and don't ask me how I came up with it but she lived in a hollow tree and um, she had to change shape and size in order to find the witches that had been terrorizing the, the forest and you know like the vivid imagination of a five-year-old but my dad he had a little Amstrad computer in his shed and he typed it all up and bound it as a proper book for me and I've still got it and I, do you know what things like that as an adult, we're so frightened, aren't we? Mm. We're so frightened of letting our imagination go. Uh, we were talking about this with the play conversation last week. But actually, that, that imagination's still there. And your kids were absolutely right to say to you, well, why don't you do it? Because you've told us we can do it. Mm. We need to take a more of a lead from our kids, I think. I think they're wiser than we give them credit for. Yeah, and when we had um, World Book Day, um, we had the TV, TV came in to cover it because they heard about it and they came and they filmed it. And I didn't know, because not on World Book Day, what happens, your kids all get dressed as a character. Um, one of the kids dressed up as the bogey princess. So she came in with um, a yellow dress on, a little red ribbon, 
a, a jar of mushy peas that said uh, bogey's keep off because that's part of the book and i was honestly completely i was like it blew me away that this that and they interviewed her and it was just lovely and she didn't tell me and she had little scrunched up um pieces of green like like stuck to her it was just really <laughs> nice and then we read it all the kids we all went to reception and all our kids read the book to reception it was just a lovely lovely thing that i never forget I think it's wonderful. So here's the question. You clearly have superstar material. You clearly, no, seriously, you've, you've, you've done television, you're an author, you are an entertainer. Um, is teaching the thing that you love more than anything? Is there anything that would draw you away from teaching? No, because everything that I've ever had, that all those things have happened because of teaching. So I went down to four days a week to, um, and then on the other day I do things like, like this and work with Nexus and work with different organizations. But um, I mean, I did some, I did a lecture with Presterly, um, skit, the teaching skit in Goldsonbury today. And everything that I talk about, about the technology I use and the things that I use in class, I know work because I've, because I've done it like the week before or I've done it that week and I've tested it on the people that I'm trying to do you know when you do you know when you see some CPD and you see some people that are really good at speaking and they're, they're very good they're very fluid and they're, but, and they're very good at speaking but you know that they've had that same PowerPoint for like five yeah. years and because it's quite far removed from the classroom I think my value is in the class this, this spare day when I do my other projects is brilliant. It's kept me fresh. I think it's kind of rejuvenated mm. my career because something's happened. But I'm very aware that all this happened because of every single kid that I've taught. And without those, I'd, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'm going to be completely honest. You've inspired me. I've um, I've been sat thinking for the last sort of few months because I'm technically I'm furloughed at the moment because I'm I was doing some supply having come back to the UK and lots of people on Twitter will know that I've been umming and ahhing about teaching in the UK and you have just made my mind up for me. Um, I want to teach. So thank you. So does that uh, give me a finder's fee then? Like, is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> Only you can get me a job. <laughs> All right, I'll try that then. Um, so um, I'm going to ask Damien if he wants to come back on because I think we've had some questions. Oh gosh, I've, I've um, not just kind of missed that. Going, or Mike is. So yeah, um, I think we've had some questions come up and I can't access those. So Mike's going to throw the questions at us. We have indeed. So we've had a couple. So thank you very much um, for, for that, guys. Uh, that was very, as Kate said, very inspirational. I, I've heard the, um, the the whale story a couple of times now, actually. <laughs> like, but no matter... It, it, no matter how many times I've heard that story, it always makes me think, wow, this is the, the impact you can have uh, as a teacher. You, the, you can literally help children shape European law. Around and do you know what? When I tell that story, I, I like to you know, I tell all teachers, I'm nothing special. I just took a risk and I just give it a go and just went with it. Every single teacher has that capability of doing it. You've just got to try. The bigger the risk, the bigger the gain. Like, you've got to just give it a or go. The bigger but yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> think as someone who took a risk and it didn't quite work out <laughs> well it, I, it evens out i suppose yeah it does I, on that i will um put you put this question this is from james bagley um on youtube um he said uh thanks simon um just come across some of the innovative work you're doing around technology in the classroom um where can i find more about the resources and strategies you are using right so i so the main my main point of contact that I use is, is Facebook so if you put at Mr Hunt's ideas in Facebook search in the Facebook you'll find me there I post some stuff on there um, I do use Twitter as well but those are my two main ones I also have a website uh, Mr Hunt from the front dot com so that's my website because that's why I say Mr Hunt from the front because I teach on the front line so that's my website and and I love sharing I mean sharing ideas and Twitter and Facebook is a, it's a great thing and if you've got an idea you share it because if you share the way I think about it is it, if, if I share an idea with a teacher that then uses it in their classroom that then helps benefit a child in their class then that's the whole point you sh we shouldn't like some teachers get like oh that's my lesson it's not it's the kids lesson yeah. and, we, and that's we're trying to teach the kids and we should give it out to as many people as yeah. we can all on the same team Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one thing, that's, um, another thing that's inspired me with um, working with Nexus when, when Damien and I um, started Nexus up, we didn't realise quite how willing teachers are to just share and get involved and just help each other out. And it's been um, another inspiring aspect. Of I'm going to say as well, as well, Mike, if you don't mind me saying, so um, I went down to four days and 
I wasn't going to, because I had like extra work coming in and extra things out and people were asking me to do. I didn't have the time because I was full time at school. And because of my time at Nexus and meeting you guys, I went right. And Damien was like, just because you know what Damien's like, Damien's like full blown, go for it. So yeah. I thought, right, I'm going to, I'll take a risk and I'll go down to four days. And since I went down to four days, I've filled my work up and more, been able to do my book, other things. So thanks to you guys, without you two, um, I would never have sort of took the plunge to do that. Yeah, agreed. You support people wonderfully, I have to say. Oh, I thank guys. Is no, this is this is about you. Don't don't bring it back. <laughs> don't be <laughs> shy, Mike. Don't be shy. I really do mean that, honestly. And like the whole, I mean, me and me and Damien went to Barcelona this time last last year um and i talked about the orca stuff there and he he, he the contacts that he gave to me and the, the nexus contacts I had meant that when we did go for a little lads day like a mandate afterwards when we went around um barcelona and went to the new camp and stuff but I did because of that. you guys yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah when, when do i get my trip to barcelona yeah right? i know this when do I get my kick? I think uh, you and I can go off somewhere next Let's time. Let's do it. I hope they're going on jollies. <laughs> Damien's put, and Morrissey. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. <laughs> just before the oh, yes, and Morrissey. That was great. I mean, yeah, that was great. Really good. Glad we did that, Damien, just before the lockdown. <laughs> but back back to the uh, topic rather than yours and Damien's uh, jollies off. Um, and we're actually, well, one thing, um, one picture, I guess, that you're painting, Simon, which probably people don't associate with, when they think of teaching as a career is is the international and the traveling opportunities that you can get with teaching you, you don't think about it but no um completely when i became a teacher i thought you're a teacher slt deputy head retire dead like that's 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 your progression i didn't realize there was all these other things out there and i think people need to know that if you're just getting into teaching now or even I mean, a lot of these things have happened in the past three years for me. I've been teaching for 10 years. There's loads of things out there that you can get involved in. Um, you just need to know that it's there. And like through Nexus and other things that we've done, I've been able to have these opportunities. I've been to Norway, um, been to Seattle. Um, where else have I gone to? Um, I'm supposed to be going, oh, I'm supposed to go back to Barcelona. Um, that, that's a few weeks ago that was supposed to be. And other little opportunities and just around the country as well. And different things can happen that, I mean, Kate's been to China and back um, and th th there's lots of opportunities out there that teaching can give you because as a teacher we have possessed you, we don't realize how the skills that we have are transferable in so many really? so many ways and if, funnily if, enough I was I was looking today at um, music jobs and uh, I, was looking, I was looking at the International School of Siena because I was thinking yeah I quite fancy a little bit of uh, Little bit of Tuscany uh, but yeah so there's I mean there are really massive opportunities for travel um, I would say as well that teaching isn't just teaching I know that sounds a bit stupid but I think a lot of people assume that all you do is impart knowledge in front of kids but actually it's exciting you know I was a performing arts teacher and as part of that I learned to set up massive productions I visited and worked in the RSC you know like really cool things not just visiting places but actually culturally yeah. doing awesome things as well definitely and if, if there isn't the opportunity out there in the or you don't think it's out there do what simon did do, do what make, he's doing with china yeah make it make, make your uh, seize your opportunities so uh, uh, yeah exactly half the end I've, I've got one more question um in here what technic technology are you using at the moment which is making the biggest impact um Simon, during right now yeah um this the zoom um i'd say zoom like online lessons so um when we go back to school i mean i was supposed to go to different schools throughout the country um and i've been able to speak to schools like like we are doing now and then when we go back to school if i can't go to a somewhere around the world i can use zoom and I, i'd say that that's one of the biggest things that that's new that I've been using and I'm always interested I mean I've just bought I've just bought it's nothing to do with technology I've just bought an electric e-scooter because they're kind of about to be legal now um I've just got one so I'm going to go because I want to reduce my carbon footprint as much as I can so um I've got an electric scooter that I I mean it's good fun as well I think I'm, well, I'm going to school in it tomorrow um, That's the real motivation. if you see if you if you live in Bury uh Tottington you see like a blinding I can only go 15 miles an hour but if you see like a speeding 50 mile an hour blow coming back on an electric scooter. That would be me. <laughs> I um, Simon, before this ends, I need to talk to you about service learning. I need to have a long conversation with you. It. Yeah. Because you and I have got oh, so many similar ideas. 
Sorry. On, on the note of, um, of, of technology and what's making the biggest impact, um, this is a question, question for you as well, Kate, in that um, this is something that came up earlier when we were having a conversation um, with a, a another um, school leader, and they were saying about how sifting through the tech that's available out there in the education space can be really difficult to, to determine what is genuinely having an impact on the children and what is just a gimmick really that's wrapped up as tech. How do you both kind of hammer in on what's going to make an impact and what's, what's gimmick? Ron, Ron Sill, does it do what it says on the tin? Yeah. Um, you know, like there's all sorts of bells and whistles on things, but ultimately, what do you need? So the first thing I would say is you need to put together your own needs, find out what it is that you want to achieve, um, and then look for something that meets that need rather than the other way around, because otherwise you're going to get dragged in by, you know, extra features that just you're never going to use. I agree. It's sometime if it's not working just don't use it like if you have the busted pen you wouldn't carry on using it you'd chuck it or you'd get rid of it and you'd use something that works it's the same with technology um you know when i went to bed there was lots of really cool stuff and you thought yeah it's really nice but how will that actually work sometimes the little simple things are the things that work the best so something something as simple i mean I've seen schools go, we need iPads. Everyone's getting iPads. Let's buy a load of them. Let's chuck a hundred apps, but then they don't look how, or what apps are actually useful. They just see a list of a hundred apps. They put them all on an iPad and they don't actually think, well, let's start with one, two, three, use those first, integrate them throughout the school and then build upon it. They just, you just get these buzzwords. And then sometimes they'll buy all these iPads and the network's not very good. So it can't cope anyway. You just got to start from the, the ground up and then go upwards. So get your network, then decide what's the best for your school. Don't just look at what people tend to be talking about. Look what's best for your school and your children because every school is different. The other thing I'd say is, um, and this is something that's really important, is that if you find a good technology provider and you find somebody who, um, you know, has worked with schools particularly, they will have a really good training model. And that means that their support for you in school is really good Um, because there's nothing worse than using an application or a form of technology where you can't get you can't get hold of the people you need to get hold of um, to make it work. Um, So, you know, like knowing that you can knowing that there's a support contact that you can just go, how do I do this Um, is really useful. Yeah, we see that a lot at our events as well, and it, it must ring true with the other schools that, that we're introducing at the Do event. You know what, as well, Damien, um, sorry, Damien, uh, Mike, sorry, I don't know, <laughs> Damien, Mike. Okay, yeah. we, we blur into the <laughs> What's What I found when I've been to one of your Nexus events, so um, sometimes schools might find that um, a provider, so when, when I've seen you, the way you, you do it, like speed days, and I've seen when they go around, sometimes uh, a school, there might be a service of... Um, piece of technology or whatever that might be really useful for the school but they might just walk past the signage or walk past the people with having sitting down and having that conversation and two-way conversation you might find other things that you might not have thought was useful for your school actually is quite useful and the way you guys do the next working event is time to sit with someone just to have that chat rather than going off who's got the nicest stand because sometimes the nicest stand they don't always provide the best service it's it's a bit of a fine line definitely thank you for that okay. so well uh... Uh, help, helping with the uh, the events front uh, it's 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 important for us with the events that the the solutions that we're putting in front of people are there to solve like kate said basically they're there to solve problems or interest that schools have as opposed to for the sake of introducing you to tech for the sake of tech's sake mm. um so no i'm i'm glad um, you find that they're interesting and useful sessions um, as a teacher yourself. Um, Barbara Valentini, uh, Kate has said, uh, Sienna is beautiful. You should definitely try it. Cool name, that Barbara Valentini. That sounds she's like amazing. A yeah, she's a lovely lady. I know, I know. Unfortunately, I have a mortgage and a cat. <laughs> it's the cat that ties me, to be fair. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, you can, you can uh, get rid of the house. Uh, <laughs> Elope to Sienna. Uh, okay, I think any more questions, uh, Damien, from YouTube before, um, or anything you wanted to cover, Kate and Simon, before we uh, close jump in? in. I've got I, one I actually have from a James. Long conversation with Simon about lots of things at another time. <laughs> 
Well, I've got a question from James. Uh, can you hear me, yeah. Mike? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, David. Cool. So I've got one. Uh, what are Simon's top three technology bits of hardware? Hardware. Ooh, Very God. specific. Mm, should, hardware. We, should we cut it down to top three technology that you're using in the classroom? Is that a bit easier? Um, top three. Uh, oh, gosh. So it's kind of like one of my favorites is my iPad. My iPad I use all the time because... Um, I mirror my iPad to my screen, my whiteboard screen. And because our school is an inclusive school for children with physical disabilities, sometimes our children can't get to the screen to write on the screen. But because I have my iPad and the Apple Pencil, I bring the screen to them. So that's some, something small that, I mean, an iPad and an Apple Pencil is so much more than that. But that's something that's, that does is very useful in our classroom and, the, and our setting. Again, because that's the needs of our children in our school. So that's one. Gosh, what else? My electric scooter, technically. So. Um, um, I saw a video last week of you on the electric scooter with the, uh, uh, the lights and everything. Do you know what? My, like my it, daughter going down the, down the road. I found when I got my scooter, I didn't realise this. I'm just going off on a tangent here. It's got lights underneath that you can set like too fast, too furious. So I, I, I made like a music Aww. video and me driving across with lights flashing. You're not allowed them. It's not, they're not legal. Like I won't, if any police officers are watching, I'm not <laughs> to on tomorrow. But um, it does do it. And that, this is the whole big kid thing. Like my wife was like, "What are you doing?" Because I was driving up and down with them. Um, you see me rolling and hey, like that, that music video playing. It's like, "What are you doing?" So I don't just leave me alone. It's good this. <laughs> That, you oh. work it into a lesson, working but your way. You know what? Um, I could do that. I might. I might take it to school. We can talk about how when we got an e scooter. How much does it cost? Do you think to, to charge it up? We can do. I can do stuff with that. <gasps> do and food the, miles? Do do the cost of food miles in terms of carbon emissions? And we can also say, does this scooter look, make Miss Hunt look cooler? Yes or no? <laughs> Evidence yeah. for definitely against. no. Well, Damien, you haven't seen me on it, mate, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more question, and this is going to be from me, and I'm going to end it oh, a bit. But can I have one, as well? one? Yeah, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I just ask, am I right in thinking that you have Pamela Anderson's phone number as a result of your fight against SeaWorld? Yes and no. Uh, I do have her number, but it wasn't against SeaWorld. So the year after ah, okay. we did... But we have the year after we did the Sea World thing, in between the other Sea World thing, we um, did a campaign about the ban of uh, zoo animals in um, in UK circuses. And part of it, we went to Ten Downing Street with Virginia McKenna's son. We went into Ten Downing Street with Pamela Anderson, so I met her for a coffee beforehand. So I have a, I've still got it, Damien. You're not having it. It's on there. Uh, next, so, next time we meet up, <laughs> yeah. I'll get a few drinks in your time and I'll hit it. I know. I'm married now. So. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt as well before uh, Kate gets her last question. Uh, have you watched Tiger King yet on that note, Simon? <laughs> yes. It's weird. Like it's it's shocking, but it's it's I can't. It's like if someone. If that was a, a fiction that you you wouldn't think it's real, yeah. um, it's it. But it doesn't surprise me that that's the way. But I, mean, I can go on about the Tiger King for I mean, people just think it's entertainment, which it is. But the whole there's a whole backstory about that. Though mm. so many things are wrong, and I don't know whether it's done. The whole Tiger people go into it more now, and now it's reopened than it before. So it's had a it hit Louis through. Yeah. yeah, Louis through hit the nail on the head. He said it wasn't. It stopped being about the tigers and the animals after episode one. It was more about entertainment mm, and um, sort of popcorn culture, wasn't it? And, and people else. forget but, about the tigers because there is tigers suffering there. So there are. However, Rhiannon does do a really good Carol Baskin impression. So if you do does want to see it? that, yeah, it's we'll get live on Twitter. Get her on now. Get her on now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's an absolutely no way she'll go from the camera. Ends the show without. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, over to you, Kate. I'm going to dip out because Mike will okay. close it. I'm going to dip out now. That's the um, answer for me. This feels like a, bit of a, a rubbish question now that we've just talked about like the plight of tigers. But um, one of the big controversial technology issues that I found um, working abroad, kids use their iPhones in classrooms. Really? Uh, yeah. So we, like, obviously it was a high school, but we would use QR codes. Uh, we would use, kids would take photos of the board so that they could remember stuff. Um, kids would record and evidence their own learning using the video feature on their camera. They would use iMovies, all sorts of stuff on their phones. Um, I mean, obviously it was monitored in that I had a phone pocket at the side of the room and they would put them in there and then it, I kind of dictated when they could use them. So they weren't out all the time. But what do you think? Because we live in a generation now that is essentially dependent 
on their mobile technology. What do you think about incorporating it into schools and education? I think that has to be a balance. I, I do think I'd, I'd seen nothing wrong with people using um, technology for things like that. For example, um, in in my class, I have a I have a Google a Google Home in class, just like that, because I've got some kid. Imagine you're a child and you. Um, I agree, we should learn how to use dictionaries and things like that. But if you've got a child that struggles to spell a word and they're trying to find use a dictionary to find a word that they don't know how to spell, then they can spend so long looking in the dictionary to find the word when they can just ask Google, how do you spell such, which is adults, what I do all the time, which is why it's there. And I think as long as it benefits the what we're doing in classroom and, and enhances the teaching and learning and doesn't take away from it, then it should be used. And we should we should stop thinking that that's, this is how it is because it's changing. And when kids grow up, they're going to have, I mean, look at the, in, in my gen, in my lifetime, I've gone from a Nokia 3310 with snake on it to like live video conferencing like yeah. we're doing now. So what's going to happen in the future? We should use it and not like put a barrier against it. It's, it's again, it's all that teacher mindset of like, oh, you know me and technology, it's not my thing. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ignore it. It's, it shouldn't be like that. But as long and as it focusing, benefits. Focusing yeah. Focusing on the negatives, isn't it? Very much focusing on the Yeah, negatives. look at the positive. It's the same with anything. Look at it just, you look at the it's like when i talk about social media which i've done on with uh, some of the nexus uh, in, um, events that i've done that if you just look at the negative side of social media that's all they're going to think about you have to look at the positive side give a balance with everything yeah. you've got to give them both is, sides is it not actually a duty a moral duty um to educate them in appropriate use i think yeah, like, you know, definitely. Like to we, ignore if, it is to kind of stick your fingers in your ears and go la 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 i don't like it and therefore it doesn't exist Mm, um, which I think the teaching profession sometimes can be guilty of a little bit not you know I can feel like I'm criticizing but you know that actually what we have to accept is this isn't going away you know like iPhones aren't going away Samsung's aren't going away smartphones aren't going away in fact if anything the technology is going to get more accessible we've got Apple watches you know mm. I got kids sat in my classes and I'm like you handed in your phone but you didn't hand in your watch and I know that you're still checking your text messages <laughs> right but the thing is, I'm not there going, you shouldn't have your watch in school. You know, instead I'm saying, look, right now isn't the time to use it. But later on, we're going to do a treasure hunt where you can scan QR codes and it will help you with referencing. And you're going to learn how to do source, uh, you know, like verifying source evidence. The, um, the QR codes thing is, is brilliant, Kate. I, I've not uh, thought about that. I, I um went through school being the uh, outspoken one that may not surprise anyone who knows me uh, Shock. Where <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i uh, my friends and classmates would poke me and say ask them to ask questions because they wouldn't put their hands up and ask questions to the teacher so i'd always be asking questions on behalf of other people and i i, I saw um a teen a um an app um at university when i went to university where you could use your phone to ask questions anonymously to the lecturer yeah, and they brilliant. could bring it up on the screen and i just thought that would have benefited so much in the classroom yeah. if the, those the, the people who, who were more nervous about asking and kind of raising their head of for the precipice to, to what it's, for me like i wonder why those kids felt like they couldn't put their hand up and ask that yeah. so i think that's a teaching point as well as the, the way the children feel it is although sometimes i think there are kids i mean this is the the invisible kid thing isn't it this is the whole um you know we notice the lower ability we lo- notice the upper ability mm. and then there's that kind of gray child in the middle that sits quietly does what they're told and doesn't disturb and so we you know we're all guilty of especially in stressful moments of going oh i've covered all bases um I think there are kids who nothing to do with the teacher just don't want to put their hands up. Um, but I think you're right that as a teacher, your job is to check on those kids. Your job is to find out what those kids understand and what they don't. But actually, Mike's absolutely right. Having an anonymous way. So I didn't do it with technology, but I had a what do you want to know board um, where at the end of the lesson, kids could write any questions they got or anything they found interesting um, on the board. And I would take a photo of it. And by the next lesson, um, we'd take five minutes at the start of the next lesson to address any of the questions. But I wouldn't say who'd ask them. It was just, a, again, anonymous. I wish I, wish I had teachers like you two when I was in school. I think um, I'd have enjoyed it a lot more. <laughs> I had some great teachers, but I also had some pretty You're not meant teachers. to have fun, Damien. <laughs> it helps, doesn't it? It does help. What I would say is, back to the ed tech thing there, I think I can understand a lot of teachers' resistance to new technology when over the last 10, 15 years 
there's a lot of technology been pumped into mm. schools it's been absolutely useless and it's mm. and it's it's been put right. in there at a high cost and it's just sat in the storeroom there's been no training no cpd they're just doing it to they've had a surplus budget and they bought right. it and that's it and, and i think that is feeling. that's having a knock-on effect now that technology is actually useful there's a stigma attached almost to the word ed tech sometimes mm. Yeah, um, yeah, and I'm not a big fan of that word EdTech. I don't think it, there's, there's got to be a better a better word for it because I think that's just been used to death over the last 10 or 15 years. And it's not, there's a lot of negative connotations and there's a lot of great technology out there and a lot of great companies yeah. you providing that technology. So I think that is one of the reasons, Simon, you're forward thinking, Kate, you're forward thinking, and a lot of teachers are, but they've been burnt. And I think that is maybe one of the reasons why they're a little bit reluctant sometimes. Um, I think also it's time consuming. I mean, let's be completely honest. When you are, which quite a lot of teachers in the UK are, let's be honest, when you are up to here and you're and you're it's sink or swim and you're literally fighting to get to the end of the week, the last thing that you want is to have to learn a new skill. And that's sad because actually the one thing we should be first and foremost is learners. You know, like how are we ever meant to teach learners if we don't know what it's like to be a learner? But um, the thing about technology is that quite often you're absolutely right. It gets thrown at you and it's like, we want you to go home and read this 50 page manual and teach yourself how to use X, Y, and Z. And most teachers faced with that, even the keen ones will go, well, oh my God, <laughs> like, when am I going to do everything else? Um, so I think that's what I meant when I said about having the support um, in place for the technology that you're using and making sure that it's simple enough to use because yeah. actually, you've got to introduce things gradually. You can't throw brand new technology that is really difficult and whizzy at mm. people who've never used it before. Yeah, And the best companies are using people like Simon to do that. Sorry, Mike. No, it's okay. I was gonna say, it's not just the um, companies themselves that are kind of um, selling that tech and promoting that tech, is it? It's, it's support from the senior leadership teams within the schools to mm. actually say, right, you need some time to actually learn how to use this and yes. attributing that time aside so that it's not, okay, go learn this in your own time when you're already, as you say, up to here. That, that's where we feel responsibility as well though, isn't it, Mike, with the events platform is we don't want to put technology in front of people for technology's sake. It has to be a solution. Yeah. There's lots there's lots of exhibitions and lots of things out there that are doing that and we want to be different. And that, that is a big thing. It's got to have an impact in the classroom. It's got to be positive. And it's got to have the CPD element. It's got to have the training around it. And we are massive prop prop proponents, is that the right word, yeah. <laughs> of that? Um, so, yeah, that's my little rant on EdTech there for you. Yeah, I would say there's nothing more frustrating as a teacher than going into a school where they have one database that's got this much information in it and another database that's got this much information in it and 40 spreadsheets in a folder on the server with this information in it and you click through onto Moodle and there's this information and the rest of it's on the internet and then there's some information you know on staff shared and and like as a teacher that goes in new you're just like what why can't you just have it in one place using one tool yeah. um but the problem is that schools are historic you know they they it's very rare that you get someone come in fresh and go right bam i'm going to collate all this and put it in one place mm -hmm. because that takes time and we all start running don't we? we no one in teaching has this really gentle casual start where they just go oh, i'm just going to sit around and organize my files for three weeks mm -hmm. you know it's like straight in bam um and no one gets that breathing space to to actually reduce it all down put it in one place find out what the right tech is and make sure that works and that everyone knows how to use it it's when you go into schools and you so many schools you'll i mean every teacher on here now if you go into a school there'll be a cupboard full of wires old monitors sometimes things that haven't been opened that have been missold on yes! so, or sometimes you don't even know it's there and i'm like where, where's this been hiding where's it because that just sometimes happens so that and the technology lead maybe goes to another school and people forget what's even in that cupboard there's just wires wires everywhere like i mean i've got one at home my man my man draw with like my wires and stuff and my batteries that i'll never get rid of just in case you never know 
Um, but um, that happens at school. This um, and at the moment, actually, it's something I've been talking about with um, when I did bet this year at the um, Unchained Teaching that I talk about having. To, I have two screens in my classroom: a large screen here and one here because I talk about cheap seats, about children being able to the same viewing angle, like a theatre. Kate, when you go to theatre, you pay more yeah. expensive. The closer you get, the further back you get. So those children at the back are they getting the same? They're in the cheap seats, well. yeah. Yeah. So um, and if you think of if you you go to school and if you got an old monitor hanging around plug it into your pc have an external monitor put it on a different wall and you've got an extra viewing you can use it an ex like an external monitor where you can slide stuff along or just mirror your screen so children over here can see or if you're getting a new promethean board or a new screen the projectors instead of chucking them in the other cupboard with all the other wires just turn it to the right leave that board there white and you can project the same thing on yeah. the other screen so you can just add additional screens I use, use existing that. technology what you've got yeah. Yeah, I used to project my whiteboard. So I'd use my projector to project my whiteboard image onto the back wall so that kids could basically see two images. They got they got the whiteboard image and then the other image as well. Mm. Um, I think, you know, as a music teacher, one of the things I found, I, mean, I worked in a school not so long ago and they were paying vast amounts of money to use um, a tech hire company for their productions. And they were using radio lapel mics and like they were being charged hundreds and hundreds of pounds to use these radio lapel mics. And I was like, surely somewhere in the school, you've got the equipment. And I was like, you seem to have the equipment because you've got the rig for it and you've got everything set up for it. And you've got channels for it, which makes me think that you do have radio mics. And they're like, no, we've never had them. We've never had them. And so one of my first jobs was to clean out the cupboards. And I went through the cupboards and I found six radio lapel mics. <laughs> and I'm like, you've got about 8,000 pounds worth of radio lapel mics in your mm. cupboards. You should and have started a, a rental company and undercut that rental company. <laughs> <laughs> so. You call me a shark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was gonna... If you're not using them, can I sell them and buy musical instruments? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, um, another thing, I've been in your classroom, so is Mike and Rihanna and, and Joe as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We have, I've been a couple of times. I've seen a class in action there as well. And the room, I went in and they were having, um, we, had a, we had a meeting, didn't we? I think, was it your teaching assistant who was teaching at the time? Possibly, yeah. Remember? And we walked in, the class said hello. And the engagement in that classroom, you had the two screens, you had the sound systems as well um, set yeah. up so it, you could hear the Juno, so everyone could hear from everywhere. Um, and it's, it's, so in, it's so inclusive. Every child was engaged. Mm. Every child was talking and, and everyone had tablets. And it was just so... It's what you imagine a classroom should be in 2020. Let's yeah. say that. But um, like it says, though, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be all brand new shiny tech, does yeah. it? You've no, got use what you've got ready in schools. So. And actually, when you were talking about the projecting and using different screens, it's as simple actually as putting extra whiteboards up around your room, like as in proper whiteboards that you use pens on. Mm. Like that, I would sometimes like. I worked in Africa as well, where I didn't have any technology and quite a lot of the time didn't have uh, electricity. And one of the things that I used to do there was that I'd have three or four different whiteboards, and I and I had a flip chart as well, and I would move my lesson around the room so that I never taught from one place I, I moved and so the first around. lesson moved and that meant that every child in that class was close enough to see something that was written down was close enough to me to feel that I was engaging them and you can do that without the technology if you really need to yeah. Yeah, I mean, there was no, there was none of this technology when we were in, when I was in, back when, when I was a lad. Back, back when uh, I was a kid. Back when I was a kid. But I had teachers like Miss Hewitt, my form teacher, Miss Jones, my English teacher, Mr. Cluett, you know, people who utilised what they had and inspired, Miss Harris, my history teacher, who inspired the class through their personality <laughs> and through their inventiveness. I think that's what sticks to people. It's not, it isn't all about the technology, it is about the teaching aspect as well. But that's the thing, though. Those teachers used what they had available to them and mm. they were brave enough to do it. And that's why they inspired you. And so that's where actually we have technology available to us. And so mm. the point is, no, it doesn't mean everything. But a brave and an inspiring teacher will use everything at their disposal to make those kids get the best experience possible. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant point to kind of summarise what we've discussed throughout the whole um, conversation really Kate is it's about being brave putting yourself out there as a teacher and and kind of experimenting look you could change European legislation um, if you just 
put yourself out there and, and, and try. Um, it's, it's about making the most of what you've got. You don't need all shiny things. It has to, if you've got something that solves a potential problem, use it. Um, yep. and, Diamond uh, for PM. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that. Definitely. And, and, and it's, it's about, most importantly, just making it interesting and getting that stealth learning in. The uh, subliminal camouflage learning, as uh, I think uh, Simon called it as well. Make sure it's fun, your lessons are fun. And um, whether it's tech-based or whether it's old school uh, white, white surfboard, blackboards even, um, it, it's make it fun, make it engaging. Um, so thanks very much, guys. I think um, we could round it off with Simon and Kate both just... Um, take time to say where people can find more um, about what you're doing. Um, Twitter handles? Yep. Okay, I am Missy at me, uh, put my teeth in, <laughs> at Missy Musician 81 on Twitter. Um, I don't currently have a Facebook account because I was fed up of watching people's dinners and getting chain mails. Am I watching people's dinners? It makes me hungry now because I'm <laughs> my um, So my Twitter is at Simon James Hunt. And my Facebook page is at Mr Hunt's Ideas. That's where I put most of my stuff on there. And I also use LinkedIn as well. Only only last year actually I started LinkedIn. Fresh to LinkedIn. And also the website both. as well. Yeah. And you're both on the Nexus website. Oh, well. and Nexus. And we're both on, on Nexus. Nexus yeah. Well, yeah. Like in yeah. Uh, you can find out a lot more about me using the hashtag keeping it kind 2021 there we go there we go <laughs> hashtag next working as well go on Mike <laughs> <laughs> you, you can find more about us at uh, at next at, uh, UK um, so yeah at next at UK so have a, a look for Kate Simon and uh, Nexus if you're not already following us um, and, and hopefully uh, more interesting conversations will follow from the back of this um, but thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Simon. Thank you. Hey, thanks thank everyone you. for watching. Um, and yeah, we'll put any uh, links. I think Kahoot was mentioned, so we'll put that in the YouTube um, description and anything else we've discussed um, will pop in the description as well that could potentially be useful to people. So thanks for joining us, everyone. Thank you. And okay. thanks, Kate, as well. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.